Good morning, everyone. It's 7 a.m., so in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for the fellows, this is the QR code, so hopefully you snapped it already. Also, just one uh, small announcement. You know, in an effort to try to in, continue to improve the uh, lecture series, uh, I've started to uh, invite uh, invited speakers this year. So uh, next week, we're going to have our first invited speaker. It's going to be Dr. Fedor Lurie. He's going to be talking about some of the survey instruments that we use uh, to uh, assess our, our venous patients. So Stephanie will be sending out uh, an email. Uh, please um, put the word out. I'd like to have a good showing for our uh, guest uh, lecturers. Okay. Today's uh, topic is epidemiology and clinical disease progression. So this is a, a very uh, complicated. This is a very complicated topic with uh, a lot of uh, information on it. So, so the real question about disease progression is what causes a patient who's a C2 to go on to a C3, a C4, 5, or even a C6 patient? So the, the short answer is we really don't know, but we have a lot of epidemiologic data so that we can uh, inform our patients as to what their risks are. So we're gonna be talking about prevalence. So prevalence is the actual number of patients who have the disease in the general population. Incidence is the number of new patients per year. Risk factors are the things that are associated with, if not directly contributing to the development of, and progression of the disease. And then we're gonna speculate a little bit of what some of these possible mechanisms are. So let's talk about the prevalence and the incidence data. So before I go into this, uh, there are literally 10 or 15 epidemiologic studies. So clearly we're not gonna be going over every one of them, but we are gonna go over the ones that are uh, quoted the most and are the most significant and impactful. So this one, the Edinburgh vein study, it was published in 2000 in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, was the first attempt at an epidemiological uh, survey as to what the prevalence is in the general population. Now, what uh, Andrew Bradbury did here was he took 1,500 random patients from the general population, didn't care what their symptoms were, he just took 1,500 patients. And he asked them if they had any signs or symptoms that would be consistent with venous insufficiency, like pain, swelling, tired, heavy achy legs, tightness. And then he, he duplex scanned all of them. And what he found was that uh, 32 or 33 percent of them had C2 or C3 disease, and about six percent of them had C4, C6 disease. And what he found was that if there was superficial venous insufficiency or reflux, this uh, symptoms uh, correlated uh, uh, closely in women. Whereas if you had symptoms in men, there was a higher likelihood that you would have deep venous insufficiency. Now, when this study was done, it was done prior to the uh, uniformal acceptance of C. So if you look at the original paper, they've split patients out into these, you know, uh, truncal varicosities without venous insufficiency. I don't even know what all that means, but what I was able to figure out by going through the study was that this category here, the trunk veins with no venous insufficiency are your C2 patients. And this grade one uh, is, uh, would be considered a C3 patient today. So in the paper, 28% of the patients had C2 disease, 3.5% had C3 disease, and as we said before, 6% had C4 disease. So this was just uh, in the general population of that 1,500 patients. The next study that's quoted often is this French study. It's a cross-sectional epidemiologic study, also uh, uh, um, has 2,000 patients in it. The downside to this study was that it was mostly telephone interviews. And what they did was they chose a subsample of patients to do the actual <laughs> physical exam and medical interviews. And what they found in, in this study was that the prevalence of the disease increases with each decile of age and it increases more in women than it does with men. In addition, when they looked at skin changes and venous ulceration, same thing, they found that the incidence increases with uh, decile uh, of age. Now, both the Edinburgh 
study and the French study uh, are slightly biased because they were done only in white people. So that's a, a big distinction that I want you to hold on to for a second. So because this uh, study was uh, a CVR study that we published where we looked at uh, uh, the incidence of CVI and outcomes of treatment based on race. Now, as you can see by the top orange color, that the incidence does increase with age. So this is consistent with the findings of the other two studies in white patients. But when you look at African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, the incidence either goes down or it stays the same over time. So this concept that somehow venous insufficiency gets worse as you get older is only true in white people. Uh, it doesn't seem to correlate with other races. And this was something that we published uh, last year in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. If you also look at the, uh, again, at the French study, the majority of the patients in the study had C2 disease, as you can see here, and a very small percentage of them had uh, C3 or higher disease. And again, this is one of the downside with the telephone interview because people who have spider veins or reticular veins sometimes say, oh, well, I have a varicose vein. So this study for me has always been subject, but it's quoted all the time because of the incidence data that they show, uh, I'm sorry, the prevalence data of the disease getting worse with age. This is the study that everybody quotes, and this is the study that was the, the, um, done the, uh, the best. So this was uh, basically Eberhardt Rabies uh, study. It's a population-based cross-sectional study, again, they looked at a general population of 3,072 patients aged 18 to 79. And what they did was they wanted to see what the prevalence of, of uh, reflux was in this patient population. And what they found was that pathologic reflux was seen in 35% of the entire cohort. 21% of them had superficial and 20% uh, and of them had deep, but that's if you use the 0 0.5 criteria. If you look at one second uh, as your cutoff point, that drops to 7.2%. But they found the same thing as they did in the Edinburgh study, where superficial venous insufficiency correlated with symptoms in women and deep venous insufficiency correlated with symptoms in men. They also found that, um, that the superficial venous insufficiency increased with age. But again, I would caution you that this is primarily a white po uh, patient population. When you look at their chart here in terms of uh, C classification, so this study did uh, divide people according to SEEP and what they found is, as you would expect, that as your severity of disease increases, the incidence of, of uh, reflux increases as well. So 49.2% of patients with C2 had reflux, 24, 67, and 72 as you go to C3, 4, 5, and 6. Similar findings, were observed with the deep system reflux, depending upon what your cutoff point was. Now, bond two was never published. So, um, you know, numerous people have spoken to Everhart asking why he never published his study, but he has presented this data on numerous national meetings and these slides are, are actually Everhart's, he's loaned them to me. So what they did was they took their original patient cohort and they followed up on them to see what how many of them progressed. And this is really what we as physicians want to know. And this is the chart that uh, gets, gets uh, presented all the time. If you look here on the far left, you look at the patients as to what they, where they started in the study, C2 non-saphenous, C2 saphenous, C3, 4, 5, and 6. So if you look at the C2 saphenous, you'll see that 21.2% that, uh, uh, of them actually progressed to C3 disease, and 10% of them progressed to C3. So overall, 32% showed evidence of progression over 6.6 .6 years for an, an annual incidence of 4.8% per year. This is the study that we refer to patients all the time when they say, well, what's my chance of this getting worse over time? And this is it. It's five. I tell people that you have a 5% per year chance of, of progressing on to worse disease. Now, this study was the very first study that was done in the United States. The epidemiologic study that's quoted from the United States all the time is the San Diego study. 
Um, it's, it's a big study, it's a good study. And the one thing about the San Diego study is that it actually did give a racial uh, breakdown distribution. So when I update this presentation, I'm gonna add it. But this study from Olmsted County in Minnesota is a, a classic study. Um, because the Cleveland, not the, because the um, University of Rochester, the Mayo Clinic is uh, uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Olmsted County has very, very good records. So what they did here in this paper, they asked if you have C4 disease or skin damage, what's the likelihood that you're gonna go on and progress to an ulcer? And what they found here was that the overall um, prevalence was 76.1 per 100,000 patients for skin changes and 18 per 100,000 patients for venous ulcers. And what they found in this study was that uh, that the uh, venous stasis diagnosis to development of an ulcer was basically five uh, years, plus or minus five years. So if you develop skin changes, there's a 20-fold uh, increase in your likelihood of developing an ulcer over the next five years, plus or minus five years. So these are the graphs from the study which show uh, um, by age group and by year. So if you look at uh, the far left, which says one, this is the same kind of graph distribution that you saw in the front study, whereas as you get older, the uh, incidence of venous ulceration increases with decile of age. But again, I would caution everybody that Olmsted County is a primarily white county, so this data is probably just reflective of the white patient population. Figure two is looking at it by the year that the data was obtained, and you can see here there's really maybe a slight increase uh, over time. And then if you look at it by sex, same kind of breakdown where um, as you get older and decile of age, the incidence uh, and the prevalence of disease increases. Uh, but whereas if you look at the calendar years by sex, it seems to have decreased in time. And this is probably a reflection of the fact that healthcare has improved over the past 10, 20, 30 years. Now, we've got some uh, additional data that I'd like to show you in terms of disease progression. So recently there's been a lot of interest in the anterior accessory great sap in Spain. So there is a study that was published in 2015 by uh, Thomas Probstel from Germany, which really didn't get a lot of play, but this is actually a very well done study. It's a single center cohort study. Uh, and what he did was he had a group of patients who had a GSV reflux who he ablated and who also had uh, some evidence of anterior accessory great sap in veins. And what he asked was, well, what is the progression rate where the AAGSV becomes symptomatic? So what he did was he had 93 limbs with GSV reflux. And Dr. Mathai, can you please, thank you. 93 limbs with GSV reflux and a visible AAGSV. So of these 93 limbs, 43 of them had a visible AAGSV, but at the time, only two of those patients, 2% demonstrated reflux. So then he did surveillance scanning at one week, then 12 months, 24, 36, and 48 months. And he had an 88% follow-up rate of four years, really, really good follow-up rate. And what he found was that at four years of the original 93 limbs, 65 limbs now had visible AAGSV disease and 55% of them demonstrated reflux. So essentially, if you have uh, a visible AAGSV with GSV reflux uh, and you leak and you and they're not symptomatic, once you treat the GSV, there's a, a very high likelihood that your AAGSV is going to become symptomatic over a four-year time period. So we uh, we recently um, presented some data to the JVS, and, and this paper is now in press. Dr. Deal is the first author on it where we looked at the outcomes of treating the AAGSV. So in patients who just had an ablation alone and did without any treatment of a um, tributary disease, by the RVCSS, they did just as well as patients who had GSV reflux. But when you looked at their civic data, the AAGSV patients actually almost returned back to baseline. So there was an initial improvement at, uh, at the one month follow-up, but at six months, they started to become uh, symptomatic again. So these were patients who just had ablations alone. When you did an ablation with a phlebectomy, the, the AAGSV patients did just as well as the GSV patients. 
So it seems that AAGSV outcomes are actually um, tied to the treatment of the tributary disease and not necessarily the proximal stump. We did not address if you just treated the uh, the tributaries, what would happen to that proximal stump and whether or not you would have a recurrence. So we did not look at that, but this data strongly suggests that uh, outcomes in AAGSV patients are, are highly dependent upon doing the phlebectomies. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how important doing the uh, ablation is. Now, what about risk factors? What are some of the things that have been shown to be associated with progression of disease? So again, going back to the Edinburgh study, this was uh, an abstract that was published uh, many years <coughs> after the original paper. And essentially what they, they found was that increasing age, BMI and pregnancy are all associated with, uh, with disease progression. The Von Vein II study found the exact same thing, uh, except they also found that a sensation of swelling, which they interpreted as tightness or tenseness was also associated with a higher odds of, of uh, progression. Now, this is another paper that, that uh, we did. Again, Zoe's the first author on this, looking at patients who have higher BMIs and again, looking at outcomes. And what we found was that as your BMI increases, your uh, outcomes after an ablation or phlebectomy or, or any treatment for your CVI is not as good as those who have a lower BMI. Uh, and this paper actually suggested that patients who have a BMI of 46 or greater should um, actually be uh, considered to not have an ablation as their outcomes are not very good, or at the very least, they need to be told that they're not gonna have as good an outcome as somebody else who's not as heavy. And they, they should actually focus on weight loss reduction rather than having an ablation, phlebectomy, and all the stuff that we've been doing to them. This paper by Cardotho Nan in 1994 is one, of, is one of the first genetic studies looking at whether or not <clears throat> uh, genetics play a role in disease progression. So in the Edinburgh study, they found no correlation with family history. The French study did find a correlation and the Bond study did not address this issue. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> if you look at the, the diagram, if both your, your mother and father have the disease, there's a 90% chance that you're going to manifest the disease. If one parent has it, women have a 62% chance of manifesting the disease and men only have a 25% chance. So my interpretation of this is that the gene is an autosomal dominant with variable penetrance, meaning that it gets passed down to every generation, but there are environmental factors that are required to activate the gene. In women, it tends to be horm female hormones and pregnancies, and in men, it tends to be you know, heavy labor and morbid obesity. And then the really interesting find is the negative negative. So there was a 20% incidence of uh, chronic venous insufficiency in patients who had no family history, meaning that some patients can develop varicosity spontaneously from you know, either bad lifestyle, morbid obesity, or other factors, which may cause damage to the, to the vein walls. So the, the point here is that both the parents have it, the patients always have 100% chance of having <coughs> venous insufficiency. DVT, <coughs> we all know that if patients develop a deep vein thrombosis, it causes vein wall damage and thickening and the development of post-thrombotic syndrome. So clearly a, a DVT uh, is gonna predispose patients to developing signs and symptoms of post-thrombotic syndrome. This diagram here is uh, courtesy of Peter Henke. They have a, a baboon model uh, in which they ligate the IVC and they develop a, a thrombus here. And you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, this is a, a normal vein, the uh, two-day uh, thrombosed IVC. You can see how big it is with the clot. And then over time, what you can see, the arrows are showing the uh, vein wall thickening that happens when um, you get post-thrombotic syndrome. This paper for the fellows, if you don't have this paper, get it. This is a classic paper by the, uh, Paolo Prandoni in which he did serial venography on every patient who had a DVT over an eight year period. And what he found was that if you had a DVT, your incidence of developing post-thrombotic syndrome at two years is 23%, and it goes up to 29% at eight years. Uh, but this is any symptoms associated with post-thrombotic syndrome. Severe post-thrombotic syndrome is 8% at five years. 
this paper was the was the basis for some of the uh, thrombolytic therapy trials that we're seeing right now, where the development of PTS is at two years. So I would strongly suggest that you read this paper, and he has two or three follow-up papers that came up after this, uh, because they're kind of classic reading at this point. Now, this paper from Peter Glavitsky in the Mayo Clinic uh, looked at the effect of deep venous insufficiency or outflow obstruction on ulcer healing. And as you can imagine, if you have uh, just reflux alone, uh, the likelihood of your ulcer healing is very high. It's at 95%. But if you have any outflow obstruction at all, the ulcer healing is, is uh, severely delayed. And at a couple of years, <coughs> only 65% of patients have their ulcer healed. But you can see here the standard deviation with the dotted lines is high at this point. This graph is the one that I uh, tell the fellows about all the time. This is looking at your uh, ulcer recurrence rate. So if you had only ven uh, uh, venous reflux, at two years, you had a 20% likelihood of having an ulcer recurrence. But if you had outflow obstruction or any evidence of post-thrombotic syndrome, at two years, your ulcer recurrence rate was 46%. So clearly, if you develop a DVT, have any evidence of outflow obstruction or any evidence of post-thrombotic syndrome, your uh, ulcer recurrence rate is very, very high. So this is a serious risk factor for recurrence. So uh, in conclusion, you know, the uh, prevalence of venous insufficiency in, in the Edinburgh study was very high. It was at least 20% in the general population. And, <clears throat> and superficial insufficiency correlated with symptoms in women and deep venous insufficiency correlated with symptoms in men. The French and the uh, study showed that there was an increase in the incidence of venous disease and ulceration with age. But again, I would caution you that this is probably bias because of uh, the high prevalence of white patients in the disease. And uh, there is clear evidence from the Bond study that there is a, a 5% per year uh, uh, rate of disease progression. So you can tell your patients if they have varicose veins and they ask you, what's the likelihood of this progressing if I do nothing? The answer is 5% per year. And then clearly in terms of risk factors, uh, age, increased uh, weight, BMI, a feeling of tenseness, pregnancy, genetics, deep venous insufficiency, uh, a, a history of a DVT and being white uh, are all risk factors for developing venous insufficiency and progressive disease. 